thank you all for coming and not running off to the beach. I can't see any of you. This is incredible. <laughs> so I'm just going to start. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how I choose typefaces for all of my different projects and start off um, talking to you about um, where I got started um, at Alfred A. Knopf. This gentleman on the left is Alfred A. Knopf, and on the right is W. A. Dwiggins, who you're prob probably all familiar with. Um, Alfred A. Knopf started Knopf Books in 1915, and he and his wife Blanche had a fabulous Borzoi dog, and this became the logo of the company. And Dwiggins was the man who started drawing these. And I start by talking about Knopf because I worked there for eight years when I started out in my career, and it was really an incredible formative place um, for typography. Uh, Alfred A. Knopf was very uh, interested in design and making sure that all of his books looked beautiful as well as having incredible content. They have many, many Nobel and Pulitzer Prize writers at Knopf. So this here, this isn't Blanche Knopf, the wife, but this is um, a lovely Borzoi dog, and Dwiggins started by drawing all these gorgeous Borzois because the, the Knopfs had a Borzoi dog, and they decided to turn it into the logo. So moving, f uh, one of the most incredible things I think at Knopf uh, that sets it apart from other publishers is the logo is a different version of the Borzoi dog. And if you work there, you're kind of under a little pressure to come up with a Borzoi dog. I'm afraid I never did. But um, the, if you look through, you've got Chip Kidd, you've got Jonathan Heffler, um, Dwiggins, Paul Rand, Alvin Lustig, all of these wonderful designers have designed a dog at one point. And here's an example where you can see a dog used on a spine. And once you've designed the cover, it's always kind of fun because, you know, no one's looking at it anymore. The editor, the marketing, the author, all the, all the different departments have to approve a cover. They've kind of seen the cover, and you can do whatever you want with the spine. And also pick the borzoi that you want, which is really fun. So um, a little more work of, this is very dark, um, of Dwiggins. Um, he also designed Electra, Metro, Caledonia, among others. And he really did beautiful um, hand lettering and gorgeous um, title pages and spines. And really, he set the tone for the designs at Knopf. Um, and one of my favorite covers done by Paul Rand for Knopf is this Goodbye Columbus. And if you, if you haven't read it, it's, it's sort of a uh, coming of age story. And there's this, this wonderful gesture, which I think is continuously contemporary and timeless of the lipstick on the cover. This could be done now. Um, and early, early on in the Knopf days, hand lettering and illustration was very prominent. And it wasn't until later in the 70s that a lot of photography came in. Um, and these are some other covers from my very old collection. You can see that Lustig and Paul Rand, these beautiful gestures in type and illustration. And now moving forward, I just wanted to talk about some of my uh, projects. And I won't bore you with all of the storylines for all of them. But this one is called Perfume by Patrick Susskind. Maybe, have you, maybe some of you have seen the movie or read the book. But it's, it's an incredible, wild, weird, dark story. And this is the first paperback I ever worked on. So I was incredibly nervous and excited. And it was for vintage books. And First, the way I approached this problem was um, the story began in, I think it's in 1890-something, when typography is really their beautiful uses of mixing, breaking all the rules, mixing serif and sans serif and scripts, and there's so much to work with. And really, when I start a project, I start with the typography. First, I read the book, then I research it, then I think about it for a while, I walk around, I procrastinate, and then, um, I head right to the typography, because I think it's the, a wonderful starting place for finding the personality and the mood of the story. And in this case, uh, this strange monster boy named Grenouille um, grows up in late 1800s France and in Paris, and he has this incredibly keen sense of smell, and to the point where he can smell how much money is in your pocket. Um, and he goes on to bottle the ultimate scent, because he's been able to bottle every single scent. And he decides he needs to find a virgin girl and bottle it. How gross. 
<laughs> but so, <laughs> so anyhow, um, moving on, um, I looked at a lot of old type books. I collect a lot of um, type specimen books. It's hard to find them these days, so unfortunately, a lot of that's lost when you're not looking through books and you're looking on the internet, but you can find wonderful type specimen books that will inspire. I started by thinking about Grenouille, and again, there's no type on this cover, per Stephen. Um, and this, I stumbled across this Erwin von Dessauer photo, and I thought this man had this wonderful, arrogant quality to his face, which was really the way this character was. And I thought, well, if I just take out the background, and focus in on that wonderful nose, because he has this great sense of smell. Um, and from there, I created this cover. And again, this is the first paperback I ever did, so I look at it now and I cringe a bit. But I took out the background to kind of create this dark, mysterious sense. Um, and then I used that research on, of perfume bottles to come up with a Bickham script, P, uh, I think it was paired with Palace script, and then Clarendon and another slab. I mean, breaking all the rules there, but trying to be true to that time period, which was a great guide for that. Um, so moving forward, um, some, some other covers here, which, you know, this seems like a very obvious solution once it has become a book. Um, this is playing off of the ingredients on the, uh, on the cereal box, for example. And really, this is a book about health and about changing your diet, eating a lot of seeds. And I just threw a bunch of seeds on the cover, and there it is. Um, and in this case, you know, it, it seems a little bit like, oh, you're pulling from the grammar of that, how easy. But sometimes the, the best ideas are the clearest and the most obvious, because you only have five seconds in a bookstore to grab the attention of a viewer. So you want them to get it very quickly. Um, this is a book I worked on for Chef Dan Barber. He has a restaurant called Blue Hill and Blue Hill Stone Barns. And he also does a lot of writing about food and sustainability. There he is on the far right. And what I did, his book is called The Third Plate. And what he meant by that, or so I thought, was um, this third plate is actually the soil, the growth, the sustainability, where he grows his corn, his carrots, his meat, everything in, on, under one farm on, at Blue Hill. And there's something really incredible that, about that. He also talks about uh, his travels around Europe and around the world, where he studied the way people farmed sustainably. And the only answer in my head was, well, this has to be, the third plate is soil. It has to be dirt. And we actually got that dirt from his farm. And I put it on the scanner. And then these guys were sort of photoshopped in. And then I tried to find a typeface that held up in the soil and uh, was also elegant and somewhat literary. And that's Archer, paired with Verlag, I believe. And in the beginning, I had a lot of soil on the type. I thought it was more interesting when it was sort of hiding under there. Um, but the publisher said, no, no, he's going to be offended. And then Dan actually said, put more soil on there. So you never know what the author's going to think. Um, moving forward, some examples of playing around with, I'd like to make a lot of things by hand, tear them up, Xerox them, uh, crumple them, and then rescan them. I don't do those things in Photoshop because I find it really satisfying to work dimensionally as much as possible. And that's uh, 176 print. It's sort of a strange kind of faux antiqued typeface, but it felt appropriate for this, this book. Um, this is a book that takes place, a story that takes place in Afghanistan. And I wanted to use a typeface that kind of had a little bit of a sense of that culture and a little bit of the sharp edges and the letters, and that's Al Parma, Petit. And in this case, this is a book about um, this family that had to hide their literature from the Taliban, so they nailed all of their books to the ceiling. And once I had crea created that image, I thought, this just needs a very elegant, simple typeface to kind of hold it up, you know, use it almost like a podium to hold the image. And here's just kind of a little back research. Um, it's really hard to find rusty nails in New York City. <laughs> it's really strange. I had to actually uh, put salt on them and water and put them out on my fire escape in the sun until they rusted. It was incredible. You'd think it was the easiest to find, thing to find in the city, but no. And then I had a lot of books that I hammered and left them out on the street. People probably thought some psycho lived there. Um, so moving on, 
Uh, in this story, I won't go into the whole thing, but um, it's a very ghostly novel, really eerie, beautiful in China. I wanted to uh, sort of merge that feeling into the typography, and that's something I think is important, that there's, there's a sense of connection between the art and the type, and you feel that they're, they're relating. Even if the art is really uh, taking over or bigger, you create some contrast, like small type, big image, big big type, small image. Um, and in this case, I wanted to reflect the image in the type. So, you know, sprayed a little water, a little ink on the, on the actual typeface. It's a trick that I've used way too many times. So now you know. <laughs> and, and this, this uh, Lolita, I wanted to take this from the male perspective. And I actually, this is the handwriting of Peter Buchanan Smith of Best Made Axes. And he, he was in my building at the time, and I said, oh, can you write Lolita again and again? And um, I wanted to have that kind of, oh, I won't do this again, I won't do this again thing. And I've, that pen is actually a Mont Blanc uh, pen. It's the actual pen that was used in the book. And I found it at the Fountain Pen Hospital in New York City. If any of you are interested in things like pens, uh, you must go to the Fountain Pen Hospital. It's amazing. And uh, they actually rented it to me. So, so I think it's really important to be accurate, you know, with, with the design, especially with cover design, and really understand the history, understand the characters, understand where things happened. It makes the design so much easier. And everybody always asks me, uh, do you read the books that you design? And I try. I try to read as much as I can. Uh, it's hard with a lot of projects, but the minute I don't and I just skim the tip sheet, it's a disaster. And it just, it's worth putting that, I find it's worth putting the effort in at the beginning before you start, because uh, the design goes so fast then. That's my little secret. This, this is a 24-hour um, book cover. They asked a bunch of designers. They gave them a brief. They said, do a design, have it for us tomorrow morning. And I had a lot of fun breaking all the type rules. I'm sure that everyone is cringing in this room. Uh, but there, it's just a combination of fun typefaces that I found that were inspired by this woman's journey on Route 66, doing a lot of pole dancing along the way, apparently. Um, and so, so that, this was a, a really fun uh, job because I didn't have to worry too much about not using more than three typefaces. Moving forward, I didn't do this cover. Uh, this is a, a cover, often uh, repackaged covers. I'll be given uh, a hardcover or a paperback and asked to uh, create a new cover for it. This was the 10th tenth, uh, anniversary of The Book Thief recently, and if any of you have read it, it's a very beautiful story that takes place in Nazi Germany and World War II, and the current cover, I don't think it's working so well. What do you think? I don't know. So, um, so I decided to move away from this, and without telling you the whole long story, uh, I wanted the type to feel uh, classic and literary, um, but also to have a sense of book burning and to have a sense of a ghostly quality, a little bit of fear in there as well. And and how I did this is I, this is Miller, I believe, or Chronicle, ooh. And I added a little water and ink, and I created this kind of experimental thing here. And often I find just working by hand in that way is really satisfying to create these spontaneous nuances that I can't do on the computer. And more, more type trials to get there. And this is a friend did. <laughs> this is a young girl, is the main character. And then finally, you know, they wanted a girl. This is always the case on the cover. And I burned that with an actual match and on the paper. And it just felt, it didn't feel quite right yet. And there were many, many versions I'll spare you of. And then I decided to focus more on what was actually in the book and the book that the girl is reading. And she's learning how to write and read from this young Jewish boy that the family's taken in in their uh, secret basement. And I literally just created exactly what she was doing in the story with a lot of whiteout and a lot of paint and using the black letter type that I imagined she was reading in this special book. Um, and that's how the final cover turned out. So it was very uncommercial for an anniversary edition for a bestseller, which I was kind of excited about. Um, again, this is uh, taking that si time, same time period uh, using that black letter is William Kingsport Gottish, which is a crazy name, uh, combining it with Georgia Sand, I believe, and I did a lot of 
Xeroxing, crumpling it up, and then rescanning it, and then doing a little more playing with matches to create this kind of war, wartime feel. Um, sometimes you get projects where you're asked to uh, work with an author who is in the spiritual category, and they're this in this case, they said, you know, we really want to get him out of this category. <laughs> and, and so no rainbows, no unicorns, no sunrises, sunsets. I was really happy about that. So I went completely away from this and just focused solely on typography and used, um, I think this was Chronicle Display. And, and then I wove this illustration through the letters in and out just to kind of evoke the feeling of the writing and, and kind of give them a classic departure from, from this situation here, <laughs> right? So moving on, you, this happens all the time and I've spared you of many of those. Uh, sometimes I think all you need is a very simple classic type treatment uh, with a subject like this. I didn't want to have any, uh, you know, asses or <laughs> pole dances or whatever. Um, it's E.E. E. Cummings after all. And this should be presented as in the literary canon. And so I used a simple uh, treatment. And actually, interestingly, the estate uses E.E. E. Cummings with caps, which I was really surprised about. So, um, And then I used the, a, a book that I scanned, and that's the, the gutter, um, to kind of create the sense of things. <laughs> So uh, moving forward, uh, this is a, a book I worked on, strange story about this pianist uh, living in Ohio or something, uh, obsessed with the war, was a teacher also, pinned clippings on his wall whenever he got home, and that's sort of what he did all the time. And I'm, I'm giving a really brief <laughs> synopsis here. But uh, this was one of my first directions. I kept thinking, well, everything has to be pinned on the cover, and it just didn't feel quite right for the book. It was sort of an odd odd um, storyline. And so I ended up thinking, what if it's just a piano key? The middle C is the mediocre, middle ground, the even key, and it kind of feels like this man, you know, the same personality. So I ended up um, looking around, asking friends who played piano, hey, do you have an extra C key lying around? No, <laughs> I can give you my whole piano. And all stock photos of piano are really cheesy. So I ended up um, calling Steinway and Sons in Queens, and I said, is there any chance you have a lone C key? And amazingly, the guy said, you know, I'll see what I can do. He thought it was cr crazy. And <laughs> they sent me a very long key like one of these, and uh, I thought, okay, now what am I going to do with this? It looked really awkward. So I ended up sending it back to him. Well, he, he said, you know, uh, I can cut it for you. And I said, well, while you're at it, can you add a C-sharp key? Because it, it looked a little lonely on its own. And so what I ended up with is sort of playing around with this concept. I got the key. It was cut uh, with the C-sharp, and I put it on a giant Pantone swatch, and it became this jacket. And it has very simple uh, type, very, you know, an as um, A.T. Sackers, uh, Roman. And I, it, felt, it felt like the appropriate type treatment for this big grand image that I wanted to personify as the character. And if you look at uh, some designers like John Gall, for example, he has gorgeous, uh, gorgeous collages and sometimes really stunning, loud artwork. And he always pairs it with a very simple type treatment. Um, it's almost like a support for the image. And I think it's important not to always have large type, large image, you know, to play on that, that contrast. Another case where I actually uh, built this thing and painted it and then uh, put the type in. Again, a case where this is a very chilly novel. A lot of scenes take place in the snow. Strange things happen in relationships. They're all kind of living in these weird bubbles. And I kept thinking of a snow globe for the concept. And of course, I had the type shaking, as it should be, inside. And the publisher said, no, no, make it straight. So you never know when you see a cover out there if it's really what the designer intended. Um, another uh, treatment where I've try I tried it. I'm really attracted to things that have sort of a trompe l'oeil effect, and they have a dimension to them. Um, and in this case, again, I felt like the image was strong uh, and represented, in this case, uh, this sexy, uh, sexy author, sexy book that this, all these publishing houses wanted to publish. And so it's this red book, 
and it's unveiling the type, the muse, which is actually the book itself. Um, sort of playing with cutting up type to show fragments. Moving forward, this is a journal that I work on. They have absolutely no budget. Um, so I chose a very simple type treatment. This is interstate. Uh, and I've, it's been a DIY operation for every single cover. I've shot them all on the Pantone chips, <laughs> just like um, the piano key. They're really helpful. And this is a case where I made an error. You know, it was a mistake. I thought, ooh, some of them can have white uh, transparent boxes. Uh, but then moving forward, none of them worked with white transparent boxes. And then you're kind of screwed. So, so really, when you're working on a, a series, you need to really think through all of those details in advance. Um, again, it's very dark. Uh, simple type. Uh, this is uh, China, Mao's China, a seamstress, a beautiful story. Um, I used Bell Gothic combined with sort of a weird uh, thread-like uh, script. I don't even remember the name. I'm too embarrassed to say what it would be anyhow. <laughs> and and it, it kind of, it, it, I, I wanted to combine the two typefaces to show um, the character, the seamstress, the young girl, but also have something a little stronger in the other type. Um, large type, kind of melding with the art. Again, a beautiful Victor Schrager image, combining it with a beautiful Heffler typeface. Um, I hope I haven't abused it. Tobias, if you're here. <laughs> um, Grayson, uh, another, actually this is, um, this is print 1760 or something again and using it to kind of create a fable, a, a tale for this book, which it really needed to feel like, uh, sort of a cross between a children's and an author's book. Again, uh, large, simple type. The most wonderful thing is to have three letters um, with the face coming through, and again, a three-letter title. Don't even ask me what this is about. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes when you have three letters you, and you have a word like moo, it should be huge and round. But, you know, it'd have to be vertical. So this is what I ended up going with, a more condensed treatment. A book I worked on for uh, the Cooper Hewitt uh, about the history of tools. Uh, it was really fun to use this sort of tactile cardboard uh, jacket. And I found this amazing typeface called Regular. And Regular, it's A2 Foundry. And I love, number one, that it's a book about the history of tools. And it's called Regular. Just seems like it should be that way. And it has all these wonderful weights, nice numbers as well. And so it was very, it was a real workhorse for this book. I was able to uh, use a lot of weights, have thins and thicks. And when you're dealing with an interior, you really want to have a book with a lot of weights moving through a few spreads, um, and so forth. Uh, moving along, uh, this is a, a brand uh, that started in 1927, um, and they were the original slingback and peep-toe shoe. So they were actually a very forward-thinking brand started by two uh, designers, Daniel Palter and Vincent DeLizo, two different men. and. My job was to basically rebrand this company, but be very, uh, very focused on the actual heritage of it and not lose that, that beautiful sense of packaging that they had back in the 20s and 30s. Um, and this is something I think about a lot in many of my projects, because often I am kind of trying to evolve the sense of nostalgia, but, but I don't want to deal with, you know, the lumberjack, beard trimming, you know, <laughs> all those things that are constantly happening, especially in Brooklyn. Everything looks old fashioned and antique. I can't take it anymore. But on the other hand, you've got to be true to the heritage and the history. And really that scavenger hunt of learning about the history is so helpful when you're looking for answers. And I'm, my dad once said to me, he said, if you don't have the answers, you need more information. And I think it's the case with design as well, with research and also even, you know, type. So Pelter de Lizo, moving forward, this is just some of their gorgeous uh, branding from the 30s, 40s, 50s. They were working with really incredible illustrators and photographers, and then the 70s happened. And <laughs> this is when they kind of fell out of the market, and I don't know what happened there, but I think Daniel and Vincent had died, and somebody else had taken it over, and then the brand fell over. And these two, uh, this couple in L.A. contacted me, and they said, 
we want you to help us bring our comp this company alive. We bought the trademark for something like $10, and we, we want to bring Palter Lizzo back. All we have are these random specimens and shoe boxes and ads. Can you, can you reinvent this? And, but they wanted to be, stay really close to this particular logo. So I went and looked through a lot of, a lot of the old work, and the scepter was a very important aspect to the two names. One thing that was kind of cool is Palter and Elizo uh, are slightly different in the type treatments. Uh, Palter is a sans serif, Delizo a serif. These were typefaces that I found online that looked somewhat similar to this. This is what I was basing everything off of. So they weren't quite right, though. They were too normal. They needed to be redrawn to have more character. So it began, the redrawing. And the, the one paying attention to this smaller E was sort of an interesting aspect of the type. And in all these different iterations, things were got thicker and thinner. The L lost its little tail there. Then it became flat. Then it changed. Um, and then this was moving forward with um, vectorizing and then adding in the scepter um, into the center, which was kind of a fun thing to try to work out. And I worked with an illustrator to do this. Um, and that was the final logo in the end, paired with engravers. Um, and now, uh, one thing that was, was fun is when you look at it quickly at first, it's time. Um, OK, moving forward. So these, these are actually all the type family uh, applied to the shoes. Moving through really fast here. I'm getting the finish sign. Um, really, really exciting to see how that working with this is biscotti script. Another probably horrifying to most of the typographers here. Biscotti script uh, to give it a little flair. Reshooting uh, everything in the TWA terminal uh, as it was done back in the 30s, and some sassy photographs to play up that original peep toe slingback edge and creating the website with those three uh, main typefaces, the store and the logo on there. And unfortunately, it looks like I don't have time to go through the Phoenicia Diner, do I? Two minutes? Uh, I'll race through. Uh, Phoenicia Diner, really, really crappy looking diner. Um, I redid the, the logo, everything, and really had to appeal to locals, and it had to appeal to um, people coming up in their zip car uh, for the weekend. Starting out, wanted to create that fun 70s, going out on the road trip. The guys looked like robbers, so we took them out. <laughs> then, you know, try to get as much on the roof as possible, uh, playing around with the type. Cubano, again, going to the Xerox machine. Uh, and finally, the logo. And, and then, oops. I'm getting stopped. Oh no! Um, <laughs> then moving towards the the uh, the menu was really fun to play off of the '60s diner menu, which is under everyone's plate, um, but also play up on "Come for the Mountain, Stay for the Food," and moving through quickly the kids' menu, recreation and type the. Terrible picture there. <laughs> the uh, the root the this got really expensive, so we just reduced it to diner. These are created out of <laughs> out of wood, uh, and at night it really looks like neon lighting, but they're wood with side paneling, and the diner in place. And I did all of the the interior too with my architect friends, which was really fun. Thank you so much. And <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.